give me just time i'll put the recording also so that's how it is perfect we're all set mehmet thank you very much for being part of the symposium thank you very much for inviting me to that other conference of yours the time is up in that kashmir issue and all i had to say there was this time is never up for mediation time can never be up for mediation so that's all i had to say in that i had nothing else to say because there's lots to talk about in mediation but i didn't have much to say because we have to understand the aspect of mediation by itself to people understand so it would have been a lot into the basics there i did not get into it but thank you very much to be a part of it you'll have to introduce yourself after this this is your show i'll come in whenever you want me to come in yeah uh, dear uh, mr uh, vikram i am so happy to be uh, invited and it's a great honor for me and uh, how can i introduce myself i have got a honorable degree of uh, professor doctor i am economy uh, based education from the university but somehow i uh, entered the international law working on the colonization or conflict resolution or two or three times i uh, just three times i was nominated for the nobel peace prize for different issues uh, it, that includes uh, to prevent a un security council legalize a new civil war in iraq that's a, a a territorial dispute but for the first time uh, defined as an internal territorial dispute and a new future uh, civil war was legalized by the new constitution of iraq and i uh, proved the nullity of that article but when we come uh, to the peace building this is uh, how i would like to uh, talk today but uh, i prepared so much papers but the un peace building process and mediation is a huge subject it can take for hours and there are hundreds of definitions in it and when we come to the, the, the definition i will try to make it as simple as possible and maybe we can uh, in, make an interactive uh, program with you and we based on your questions as well but mm -hmm. the mediation is something uh, in the legal sense is different and uh, the dialogue is uh, also another important point I mean, what we uh, made with you, uh, with the think tank organization uh, Ankasam, is the first of its kind in Turkey, because for the first time, a pro, uh, symposium or conference was organized and people from India was invited. And uh, this is the first time that the dialogue point is opened. I mean, uh, when we come to the point of uh, peace uh, building, or uh, conflict prevention or <laughs> reconciliation after civil war there are always uh, different approaches but uh, we should mention especially one thing i mean i myself define uh, the civil wars or the peace building processes in different senses i mean everybody knows that classically uh, after the uh, establishment of the united nations and when the conquest was forbidden for the first time uh, in, in the world then uh, there exists the proxy wars. When there exists the proxy wars, not all the civil wars are proxy wars, but when there exists the proxy wars, the solution of the proxy wars based on the states who encourage these proxy wars. So, for example, uh, we don't need to uh, mention the names of the proxy wars, but so no definition, academic approach, or individual capacity can be enough or the intent of the people can be enough for uh, solving uh, or being a mediator in a proxy war. <clears throat> and the second part is, uh, this is the most dangerous uh, part, when it is not a proxy war and it's not a uh, short term uh, civil war, it's a long term civil war, then when the economy is based on the civil war <clears throat> and there exists the problem of who has got a right to represent the society. <clears throat> this is the most important point because the people who said that they have got the right to represent the society, I divide them <clears throat> into two. One is the most dangerous part, <clears throat> the uh, use of force part of the uh, non-state armed group. The non-state armed group took the monopoly of the representative of a nation. Even uh, they managed this by uh, fear. <clears throat> 
I can give the example of the LTT of Sri Lanka. And uh, this is an interesting issue. I mean, the peace building begins with uh, pre-negotiations, and uh, especially in the UN system, pre-negotiations are made during the human rights nations in Geneva three times a year. And I received many death threats from the pro-LTT members inside the United Nations, because I said that the uh, United uh, Nations Human Rights Council investigation report on uh, Sri Lanka did not define LTT as a terrorist organization. And when I uh, made a site to Ant Bondan and asked for the implementation of UN Global Counter Terrorism Strategy and also need to open an committee of inquiry on the finance of terrorism as an obligation. And they said that, oh, we are not defined in the report as a terrorist organization. Even they make ethnic cleansing to the uh, Sri Lanka Muslims, killed two presidents and killed hundreds of civilians. Uh, they stay inside the UN as a freedom fight. Now we come to another point. Till 1994, in fact, killing of civilians was a legal right by the so-called uh, uh, national liberation movements, but I say by the so-called national liberation movements, because to be a national liberation movement, also you have to pass some certain states inside the UN. And unfortunately, because of the Cold World War, uh, many you know, so-called non-state armed groups still inside the UN, this is included, uh, act as the old freedom fighters, and they said that we have got the right to kill civilians. And they took the monopoly of representing a nation or the people. And this is why I, uh, and why the UN uh, Human Rights Council resolution did not uh, define uh, the LTT as a terrorist organization is in fact, uh, and do not implement uh, still the UN Global Counter Terrorism st uh, Strategy is something. The states want to control everything. The UN is based on a hegemonic stability theory and they, Big states want everything to pass by the UN Security Council. If a committee of inquiry is to be opened on the finance of terrorism by the Human Rights Council, even if it cannot be a binding, by linking to some Security Council resolutions, it could be made by binding, then they will lose the monopoly. And the other dangerous part of it is the profession of uh, the so-called people representing the nations. They don't need to be a, a non-state armed group or a non-state armed group designated as uh, terrorists. But they are individual people. And when the, these individual people are earning their money and their life, and they have got a wonderful refugee life than the others, and they are not working, and they organize some uh, NGOs, and they are founded by uh, different ways, they are not after the solution. If the solution comes, they will lose their job. I can give a funny example. Uh, this is the reality. I solved the citizenship problem of the all minorities in Myanmar. This is the including the Rohingyas. And before my solution, uh, all the Rohingya so-called leaders, or most of them, or near, near all, they asked their right to get back their citizenship. But when I solved this, they stopped asking it because there is a solution. But what they ask is, uh, they want a UN guaranteed safe return back. This is, when we go into the UN system, this means that we don't want a solution because UN guaranteed return back of 1 million people or more means that a huge number of UN peacekeeping force and it must be financed. And the UN peacekeeping force is based on the most important subject the consent of the state, Myanmar will never want. Then it means that we ask for a humanitarian intervention that is responsibility to protect. And I do define them as the peace borders. This is the important point when we come to the uh, position of being a mediator is something different. Opening the road for dialogue is something different, but spoiling the future is something different. And most importantly, uh, in the Myanmar issue, I give the example, they entered hate speech against Buddhism. They do not define an army of uh, a regime, or you can define a racist regime. These are different things. But when you define Buddhist Myanmar army making genocide, this is something different. 
it comes to a head speech against a religion. This is a breaking point. And uh, we never say that Christians made genocide to the Jews, we say, Nazis. But the educated people in Europe, when they use this language, there are other Muslims living peacefully in Myanmar. They uh, put, try to put dynamite in the society of all Myanmar. And also there's an interesting point. Do, uh, I will come to a conclusion at the end. When I say that <coughs> pre-negotiations I do accept as the human rights council of the sessions, there's an interesting point. Some people invite me <coughs> to enforce disappearances. Site event inside the UN. And on my side, I will come to that point the responsibility of non state armed groups designated as terrorist or not, their obligation to respect life, not limited with international humanitarian law, but as well for human rights law. I will come to this point later. But after my speech, a UN recognized national liberate, uh, UN recognized non state armed group. And uh, I don't want to give name, but their representative with the batch of their organization, a recognized non-state arm group, responsible, blamed me of supporting of the states when I said that also the, the non-state arm groups are responsible for the enforced disappearance. Can you believe it? In the pre-negotiations uh, position in the human rights session, they blame me of protecting the right of the people. And they still go before 1994, Cold War period. And uh, they said that we have got the right to kill anybody. Now, what can be done? First of all, uh, the peace process before, during, and after is a very hard position. I mean, there is a famous word. Uh, yes, we talk with uh, terrorists. It's the obligation of the mediator to talk with everyone. This is how the uh, Afghanistan peace process had done. The UN had uh, dealt with the Doha Agreement. When the United States uh, signed the Doha Agreement with the Taliban, Taliban was still in the United Nations Security Council terrorist list. And they <coughs> annexed the uh, agreement. Uh, they, asked, uh, they decided to go to the United Nations Security Council and uh, to take the Taliban out of the terrorism list, but the UN Security Council, 50% put the Taliban out of the terrorism list, 50% is still as a uh, terrorist organization. This is a technical issue of how the UN Security Council resolutions are made. And I warned the Taliban in May and sent their message because they do not understand what has happened uh, to them. Still, they do not understand because <clears throat> before the agreement, Daha agreement or during the Daha agreement, even it is uh, Taliban is terrorist as a, te a terrorist organization, it is a civil war. And in general, when, uh, in a civil war like the old times, if you conquer the capital, if you seize the capital, you can have the right to uh, take the legal regime. This is called the revolution as well, how the revolution goes. Many states cannot recognize it, but the UN recognizes it, and like the Cuba revolution. But what has happened, this is the point of how uh, making the peace and being the mediator. When the whole agreement was annexed to the UN Security Council resolution and when the Taliban accepted the Daho peace agreement to be uh, taken to the UN Security Council, it is no more a classical civil war. And Taliban entered the obligation for ceasefire and transnational government. When they refused to do it, it's an illegal regime. I do believe that the Pakistan foreign ministry misunderstood the position and they uh, still thought that, uh, they still think that uh, Taliban has a right to conquer like the, uh, 20 years ago. No. Now, this is an important point of how peace cannot be made. So when we come to the peacemaking, <coughs> before uh, the uh, First World War, peace means victory. One side has the one war, and peace comes by a peace treaty. And 
let's remember the uh, famine of uh, Germany. To make Germany uh, sign the Versailles Treaty, they still made the uh, uh, blockade of food to Germany, and more than 250,000 people died after the First World War because of the food blockage, so that they forced the, uh, Germany to sign the treaty. And this is one of the reasons of the Second World War. After the Second World War, victory is forbidden for the states, but the logic of victory is still inside it. And the, in your speech, you mentioned about the colonial origins of the conflicts. I mean, maybe 90% uh, of the conflicts of today in America as the continent is the origin of the settler colonialism still going on. And the people, First Nations or indigenous rights, when you go on to the origin of it, root causes, and maybe the most important part, maybe social anthropologues must be much more mediated in peace building because they know the society much better than psychologues. And in Africa, I would like to mention also one thing. United Nations is established on European culture. United Nations uh, Charter as well. And Universal Declaration of Human Rights, before one year of the uh, Declaration of the Human Rights accepted, UNESCO opposed and said that, hey, you cannot make individual-based uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is not the world. This is Europe or settler colony states. Asia and Africa has different values, cultural values and community values. But when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights based on uh, individual capacity, because at that time there were only 55 states, we have got a European concept of human rights, no community rights. When we do not have community rights, my dear friend, Ms. Sarah Alter knows maybe much better than me, the problem of community land rights, because the Europe doesn't have this concept. In many uh, small or big uh, conflicts are originated from the community land rights. And uh, maybe they impose by the decolonization process, European concept of uh, state, centered state, and this is against, in fact, how the peace was managed by the Roman Empire or the Ottoman Empire, because they have got a different kind of autonomy given to the people. They never uh, give damage to the local people. And uh, this, uh, for example, at the period of time, Ottoman Empire as a Muslim country is the protector of the Orthodox against the Catholics. And many places are taken by diplomacy. And Roman Empire import the guts of the uh, places that they conquer and they give the autonomy. But when the decolonization process has been made and then the, it's imposed by the European educated and European uh, minded the people, state, uh, classical state centered system went entered, they have got hundreds of uh, conflicts. And uh, divide and rule. Uh, by the minorities is the origin of what is happening in Myanmar today. And what is, has happened in Sri Lanka, Rwanda, origin of the conflict. If you uh, approach in a European concept of uh, peacemaking, you can take the hatred for the just a uh, period of time. But this hatred entered the denials of the people and it cannot be uh, solved so easily. Now, dear uh, Mr. Vikram, I've got so much huge documentation uh, in a way, but the concept is important. How we can make peace and how the mediator can make peace. Now, uh, other than states, there are the racist states. And of course, people has a right as a state, as written in Article 51 of the UN Charter against a racist regime to protect themselves. Uh, on self-defense. This is the legality of using force. But uh, this legality of using force can be uh, in exceptional cases like Rwanda, like what has happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But for example, it's not valid for Kashmir. No one has a right to kill an Indian soldier or a Pakistan soldier. But 
when human rights stations, when some people comes and they use the word of freedom fighters, they openly say that we have got a right to kill a soldier, that uniform or this uniform. And when we come uh, to the state policies, states uh, centered peace building, I mean, is out of for the last 10 years. I mean, especially after the Cold War War finished, uh, how can I say, people-centered peace building and people-centered peace uh, process become to uh, enter the life of the UN peacekeeping slowly and slowly. And human rights security-centered peace building takes place. Now, uh, what is the meaning of human rights security, human, uh, human rights security-centered uh, peace building? that we can give any X country, then a non-state armed group or two non-state armed groups or maybe five non-state armed groups fighting like the Great uh, Lake Wars or one uh, non-state armed group like LTT in the past occupied the territory and there is uh, on the other side the state. When one side does not respect to the Human rights obligations. This is the missing point inside the UN system. Then uh, the other side, that's the state, as well goes in the same way. And at the end, it's always the states win the case. It's the exceptional cases that the uh, guerrilla movements can achieve. And with the drone technology of as of today, I think no guerrilla movement can uh, survive in the near future. Maybe in uh, 20 years of time, like in Syria, we will have the urban warfare or urban uh, guerrilla movements. This why I say this. Uh, everybody knows that uh, there is the positive peace and negative peace. When there is the negative peace, it's our obligation to go on uh, to impose uh, uh, conflict prevention methodologies, and there are so many things everybody knows. Uh, the details. But when an ongoing conflict, when it is more than a rebellion, insurgency, and they control uh, territory, what we need to do is, this is a missing point inside the UN, is that everybody knows that uh, international humanitarian law, that is the Geneva Convention, even the uh, non-state armed groups designated terrorists or not, are obliged to fulfill their obligations for the Geneva Conventions even they are not uh, a threat. And second, we cannot do it, even they are not a signature. It's not my opinion. It's the special reporters, uh, they give a declaration and it begins for the first time war for the LDT. The non-state armed groups designated terrorists or not, their responsibility for the implementation of CCPR, that is the civil uh, and uh, two conventions, civil pol uh, and the political rights, civil, political, and cultural rights, the uh, two conventions. There is no mechanism to force for them. I mean, it is just, how can I say, mentioning right to life as uh, based in the uh, process of uh, international humanitarian law, but they don't have a right to do anything. And if the non-state armed group is cruel like LTT, is cruel like the Taliban, the new regime, and the people for, Till the uh, coming to a peace, cannot have any chance for their basic common rights. This is the missing point. And how can we for, uh, force them? Now it, we come to the important point. You can make peace fire, and you can make a peace agreement. Now international criminal court uh, orbits a blanket amnesty. I mean, Sierra Leone in 1990, uh, Loma Agreement, when they had given a, a blanket amnesty to all the war uh, criminals. And uh, the UN Security Council did not accept it. I mean, also we have to come to the most important point. What is the amnesty and which amnesty must be given to whom? I mean, if I am a person born uh, in a territory of a war uh, lord and I was taken by force as a child soldier. And when the peace treaty was signed, I was over 18 years old. What will happen to me? It's an important question. And every Tamil in the LTT as a soldier is not a criminal. 
they took them by force. And how we can uh, regain them to the society? Yuan had made uh, good examples for it. So we have to say that the amnesty clause must be uh, forbidden for the big bosses of the non-state armed group or the non-state armed group designated as terrorists. And there is the dilemma. They are the people to decide for the peace process and sign it. I mean, if this is the spirit of, uh, of the uh, peacemaking, if the person, if a warlord knows that after uh, the peace fire and the peace agreement, when we leave the arms, he will be taken to somewhere and be put in prison. This is the dilemma. But if you give an um, amnesty to that, then there is a problem of the future legalization and legitimization of war crimes, small bit and other for the people. It will be an example of this dilemma can be solved. I mean, uh, this must be the important point. How uh, a peace can be achieved. I mean, I am in a way against Norwegian peace process. Norwegian peace process is against uh, like the past uh, in Sri Lanka giving amnesty to the leader. But they say that if you do not give amnesty, you will not sign the treaty, peace treaty, or even will not sit on the table. But if a war criminal who made ethnic cleansing to other people are legalized, can this peace be sustainable? <laughs> then let's go to the back. How can we achieve the sustainable peace? Because maybe after 20 years, because uh, fragile states or uh, failed states <laughs> or other states, if another problem occurs after 20 years, we, people will still take arms because they will remember in the past that they were legalized, legitimized, and they, it, the person is their hero and they can refight. They can again put bomb in the cities to make their uh, demands be accepted. I mean, so in this point, I think uh, the manipulative mediation outcome oriented approach can be achieved in a way that can be, uh, I mean, the manipulative mediation should force the state and the non-state art groups, you uh, say uh, this is what you, uh, is something different, not to decide, but to manipulate force. There are uh, different ways and they can say going train, uh, carrot and stick uh, in details, uh, but in a way the manipulative mediation can <coughs> put some leaders in special prisons if they are working for their leaders to achieve the peace. But can peace come? I mean, there's also another thing. I'm living in Switzerland now. I'm Turkish already. And still, you can see even the second generation of the people uh, who are uh, born in Switzerland, they could not still integrate to society. Their fathers came in the, mothers came in the 20 years of them and they are Switzerland born, and they cannot still integrate this civil society. This is also an interesting point, even for the sixth generation of the Turks living in Germany. Integration and culture are different things. And how can we wait uh, a country after a long period of civil war come to a position of a Europe and can uh, implement, uh, how can we uh, wait the state to implement the uh, civil and political rights like in uh, Europe or in the United States? I mean, when uh, we try to also remember the war economy of the long periods, I mean, how can we achieve peace in Yemen? 
human sufferings, hatred comes into the life. And because of the war crimes of both sides, hatred is the main issue. And then when there was, uh, there is no gun in the society, peace was established, how can they manage to live in the same city? I mean, how this mediation could be made? I mean, religious can be a methodology, but when we come, most of the times, the religion's difference in Islam is the origin of the conflict. Or how do you understand the religion when we uh, come to the position of the Taliban? Taliban is also 50% Pashtun. And their understanding of Islam is different. And uh, even with, with the Sunnis, their prudence approach is different. I mean, uh, they do not accept maybe uh, Turkey as a uh, Muslim country because we listen to music. And then how can you make mediation in religious matters? These are the unanswered questions. And then uh, nobody knows. There are so much huge academic uh, documentation approach, but uh, most critical questions, there is exists no answer. I mean, even less uh, Taliban is a hard issue because it's a religious authority and different fractions in it. Let's come to the uh, Africa warlords. Small, based on war economy. And the origin of the conflict lost its aim. And the people now just fight because of fighting. Huge uh, documentations, but uh, the documentations can be much more successful uh, for the past, not for the future. And now, can you ask me the questions in my speech so that we can turn it to an interactive dialogue? It's wonderful listening to you. Why should I intervene? If you, I mean, the main thing is, look, the fact is that the objective view that you have, I really like that. So that we need that objective view. The important thing is we need mediators like you. One is to be able to talk about the what the issues around it one is to actually be able to get people together and that is what you said and which i really well, who are the people who have to be on the table because mediation you have to have parties who mm -hmm. are those parties i think that in these conflicts is the biggest issue i mean there was one particular i had done this session on role of mediators in global problem solving and this was one issue that came up who are those parties who are going to be there? I mean, people-centered peace building is the most important point. This is not what I, uh, I found. This is for the last 10 years approach. But to make peace, the other part, who has got the gun? Armed state, armed group refuses because they say that we have got struggling. We have got right to decide in the name of a nation. I mean, for example, uh, I want to give my example on Western Sahara. Maybe both sides say it. It will be funny. Uh, when Trump recognized uh, something on Western Sahara, the Polisario Frontier, with uh, more than 100 NGOs, wrote a letter to the new uh, president, Bida, and <coughs> they asked to nullify the recognition of uh, Trump for Western Sahara. And I wrote an article against the letter of the Polisario Front. And I wrote that you cannot nullify the null. It is null. The recognition of the Trump for uh, Western Sahara as a part of Morocco is null because we have to create the obligations and the obligations of the UN Security Council. They ratify Pacto Sur Cervanta, good faith. You cannot say this. You are not above the decision of the International Court of Justice. You are not above the decision of the UN Security Council resolution, and you signed it. So I did something better than Polisario Front and more than 100 NGOs. But Polisario Front doesn't like me because also 
I do ask the implementation of CCPR, Civil and Political Rights Convention. Uh, Algeria ratified it, and the Polisario camps are in the territory of Algeria, and Algeria has an obligation to implement wherever it is. In, this is included the refugee camps. So I try to go on my obligation. At the end, both sides said me. But when we try to create the uh, legal work with the obligation of the UN documents, then <laughs> we have got something more which must be on the table. So Polisario Front says that I am the only representative of the Western Sahara people. But we don't know what is going on in the camps. Let's the camp, let the uh, implementation of civil and political rights. If you are a non-state armed group recognized by the United Nations, you cannot refuse it. And Algeria has an obligation to do it. And <clears throat> if it doesn't happen, how can we say that the right to self-determination of the people is a conflict prevention mechanism? I mean, why do, uh, don't uh, the people in, living in the town of Kau have the right to internal self-determination during their life in the camps? It's not a military camp. If they do not implement the, this, then it will be something like a concentration camp in a different manner. And <coughs> maybe the most important thing is how peacemakers <coughs> can put the people on the table. I mean, maybe we need 20 years because 20 years is a very short period asking from the UN uh, to prepare a declaration on peacemaking and people-centered peacemaking uh, or peace building process by which we can create an obligation for the non-state armed groups to uh, accept and their refusal can be put them out of the UN system. But Mehmet, I'll tell you how I look at it. I look a little <laughs> differently. Of course, I try to break things down to very simple levels. So first thing, the fact is that the mediator itself in this world of almost 8 billion people, this world has not been able to find those people that countries can trust or people can trust to resolve the disputes. Now, what I'm, how I look at it is that what happens at the community level is reflected in society everywhere and it is reflected in the world. Have we just lost faith in people helping us? So we are, of course, in the symposium, we are going down to some basic level there. You picked on the word on colonization, how colonization has affected the psyche of people, how they are, in terms of collaborative dispute resolution, has that gone out of the window? Why did it go out of the window? So those questions definitely we answer, we will answer. But the point is that the mediators by itself are people whom parties have to choose. So one, we don't even know who the parties are. So first, get the parties. Now, parties have to choose the mediator. The mediators are not there. When you hear on the international level that the country will mediate, how does the country mediate? People have to mediate. It is a skill getting people together and getting them onto a platform where they can agree to something is a skill by an individual. So they are getting lost in this thing. They feel countries by themselves have some role. No, people have a role. We have to start identifying people at the community level and at the international level, at both levels. It is a may, way that we have to understand is what how dispute resolution happens. People help people resolve disputes. So I think that basic aspect is, of course, getting lost. On the aspect of you talk about the groups and armed groups or whatever, I am saying, does a country's government also represent that country? I'll give you an example of India. I would be, I mean, we have to go into the statistics of every country. I have, do not get into that. You would know better on that maybe. But I'm saying, say in India, we have an election. 60% of the people go and vote. Only about 60%. And we say a 60% is good turnout in a constituency. We are broken up into various constituencies. So 60% voting in a constituency is considered good. It can be less also. Now, out of that, because of this multi-party system, if you get 30% of the votes polled, 
That means 18% of the votes in that constituency, you win that constituency. How do you say this is a democracy and how do you say this is majority? If 18% can go out and rule, I mean, let's call the word rule, I'm not, it's not a good word to use in a democracy, but if you run a government with that, definitely there will be issues, which will be in a lot of countries. So I think we also have to understand do governments represent people? And whether we are going to, because of how we use technology, how we go about it, how do we reach people and get them involved in these processes on a large scale? So that's one thing how I look at it. I'm your thoughts on this. Uh, well, this is the wonderful question because uh, as, uh, how can I say, the democracy is understood as a Western style and it imposed to the world. And every society and every culture in their past has different approach. And during uh, all these things, uh, because of Westphalian nation state building approach, the Europe is successful in it because they solved the minority problem, the Europe, by forced expulsion, especially after the Second World War. I mean, France uh, doesn't have any minority problem because after the French Revolution, uh, they forced French language to be the main language. So when we got the example of uh, a bad history and this is imposed to us and has nothing to do uh, with it, you will have the problems and people doesn't believe in the democracy or corruption, or we cannot know what is the real votes. I mean, the real results, we don't know. I cannot have the answer for it. Because when the colonization had been made subject to the Western values, and the constitution is prepared by the uh, colonizer country, we have got all these problems. And of course, the hatred came into the position and majority of the people for hundreds of years or 200 years or 100 years were ruled by the minority as the police of the <laughs> colonizer country in many places. And the result is uh, all the conflicts of today. I mean, this is what the, the origin of the Rohingya problem in Myanmar. This is the origin of the problem in Sri Lanka, and this hatred uh, entered in many places in different parts of the world, especially in Africa. Yeah. Well, the, I cannot have any solution. No, but the point is that the colonial concept of divide and rule, that is what they had to spread, because if 5,000 bureaucrats could rule over 30 million or 300 million in our case, 300 million people, you had to do that. How do you, you have to divide society and that's what we are of course facing. So how, I think the solution first, I would look, undo what the colonial system did. We are looking at, look, we, in our discussions, we are looking at the court system and we keep talking about the court system and how the colonial system finished off tradu traditional dispute resolution methods. So that part of it, the colonial effect, here, the divide and rule, how has, is how people have been divided? How do we get them together? So the whole concept of communities coming together, I think that grassroots level activity, I think you said, of course, 10, 20 years in the life of the world it is nothing in that sense. For me, every moment is important because one innocent child killed in one corner of the world because of any conflict. For me, that's important. But of course, solutions, we have to keep working on those solutions. So I'm saying at the grassroots level, I, what I'm trying to put across is that collaborative dispute resolution has to start first, let's start in schools. We have seen a country like India, we have 250 million children in school. If we can get this 250 million children getting involved and getting the whole concept of the collaborative dispute resolution going when they move into the world in society as they will be everything they are the, the other people who want to be in workplaces they are the one to be diplomats and bureaucrats they will be heading going into the un and everywhere everywhere so if we can start changing that i think 
it is just one rotation. I mean, 250 million that are there right now in schools in India. Similarly, if you look at schools everywhere else, you can just count the number of people there. So if we just move one turnover like that, it won't even take maybe five to 10 years, but suddenly we can have a totally different mindset coming into society. So I am looking at, I'm going, like I told you, my I like to break things around in very simple terms. So I, one is that way that we can look at. So what, any thoughts on that? I mean, let's remember ex Yugoslavia. I mean, grains of peace and peace education is the most important part. And to take the hate speech inside it, I mean, in general, the peace can, the education can be made. But let's remember ex Yugoslavia. Your neighbor become your enemy. <coughs> and some people are uh, killed their neighbors because of the past. And when some. <coughs> Uh, this is the most interesting point. They have got a hatred of 700 years to the Muslims because when the Serbian kingdom be become powerful, Ottoman Muslims came, that is we, Turkish people, <coughs> and won the war. And they said that they are taking the revenge of it. Even after 700 years. So we can achieve peace, maybe <coughs> Uh, by social anthropology as well, but we need time. Peace education can be given, but when they come to the, their home, what is I, at home? But Mehmet, I, I think what we lose out in this entire thing are the vested interests. Those vested interests which are sitting at the back, you just you might be sitting on a table. You are, might be looking at wanting peace, but if there's someone whose head you who's caught your head and saying he's shaking it, no, no, no. It's not in yeah. your control. So are we also going to start looking <laughs> at those vested interests and how we can undo their power? Huge vested interest. The arms industry is such a major vested interest. Oh, it's oh, vested. I, we don't... Uh, but that's what we have to touch. Reality. We have to that's be touching those. Idea. I mean, I mean we're not, the scale, like you can't even understand the scale of those industries and power in this world comes from money and the kind of money that you have uh, from there the, I mean, those vested interests, if we don't talk about, how do we have someone sitting on a table on, on his free will and discussing things on a free will? I mean, uh, all the money that the uh, U.S. had spent called, uh, written on the media. And the reality is the money is real, but only 2% went to Afghanistan. Yeah, 98% salaries, materials, contractors, blah, 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 blah. But if Never entered the Afghanistan. But I mean, put a figure to it. Put a figure to it. Don't just say 90, 98%. What is that figure? If you just put that figure out, how many trillions of dollars? I you, don't know. Nine, more than nine billion. Oh, I, billion. I lost about a billion. Yeah, we're talking in trillions. Now, billions have gone. Or trillions. trillions. And imagine. And we oh. can uh, rebuild a new world. But what I do believe is that if a new concept can come to life, I mean, uh, some people are asking, including me, but I learned that some people are asking. So I begin to ask as well. A new de uh, universal declaration for human rights with the new values. And for Africa especially, or in Asia, if you can put uh, social anthropologues on, uh, in the constitution of uh, the, uh, their values, uh, of the past to be put in the constitution. I mean, this is the community land rights, their traditions. As a, uh, you mentioned, mediator process, they are the important points for peace building. But if big states want to create a civil war, they do it. Look, I tell you, you that cannot I'm saying, prevent it. I'm saying, look, a people to people, there can never be a problem. I mean, the, the people to people, the relationship is something when you meet, you will meet someone from anywhere in the world, all, all those things are lost. It is now a person to person, but someone creates that enmity, creates that difference. Now, the point is, again, I'll still go back to vested interests. They will, that if we do not in some way work on that, how do we ever ever get people together. So I'm just saying that we always have these discussions, but sometimes I feel that the people who let you have that discussion have just let you have that discussion so that you feel happy. Go, have a discussion, have a peace conference, go. The, they're controlling but it from the is, back. 
Well, origin is development. Everything I think, is. I think look, so maybe economy. for me. Yes, everything origin starts from how society makes money important in society. When did we do it? If you go backwards, when did we do it? If you can undo it, can you undo it? I mean, why why uh, you cannot make, how can I say, civil war in Europe? I mean, ex Yugoslavia is exceptional case in Switzerland or French, blah, blah. They've got a future. And people cannot see their future. And it goes on. I mean, the Europe controls the world. I mean, if the world was not shaped by the Europe, this includes Ottoman Empire as well, Roman Empire as well, if you go to the thing. And how the colonization made by the principle of utopian status, artificial borderlines. Afghanistan, if there was no great war uh, of the 19th, 19th century between England and Russia, Afghanistan can be a different place. And they will never be. There will never be a, as of today's Afghanistan borders. So we are talking something other, and all the uh, values of uh, how can I say Africa, Nigeria, more than hundred of local languages before the uh, colonization, hundreds of kingdoms, local kingdoms, and even let's remember uh, India before the decolonization, more than five hundred and. 50 princely states. And remember Bangladesh. There was no Bangladesh as of today. Also, there exist princely states. And let's remember Myanmar. There was the Kingdom of Aragon and the Burma's Kingdom conquered there. And then the uh, United Kingdom, the British Empire conquered to the uh, old Burma. Today is Myanmar. So artificial. Uh, frontiers, artificial states, but uh, they were made at that time for the theory of a demonic stability. We can have some civil wars, but uh, not every place will have the civil war. So we, uh, less people are to die. This is the decision of principle of the old colony borders to be the new uh, borders. So they say something different, but when the economy is always depend on uh, the, I mean, how best prevents the development policies of the uh, countries, then uh, we will always have the civil war. I mean, if I am earning for uh, three dollars, and if I am uh, cannot see my future, and if I am fifteen years old or eighteen years old, what will I do? I will do everything. I think we have to now start breaking it down, like I said, to very simple terms. What can we start undoing? Divide and rule is in our hands. If we do not let anyone divide us, how can they divide us? So let us look at why that happens and how that works. How you want to respect power and authority. That power and authority, if you respect that power and authority will continue. Be it religion, be it politics, anywhere. The point is you have some people who want to control and some people are willing to be controlled. So if we have to start looking at how, what you can undo there, money, the fact whether money plays an important role or not, def definitely is in our control. And that doesn't start at the national level. It starts in your family, in your community. So I'm breaking it down to very simple terms. I think we, because we look, this aspect of the what is happening in the world is happening in the world you are looking at it and you have ob obviously looked at it very carefully i am on the very 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 basic level how do we in a very at a very basic level start putting solutions together so i'm just putting my thoughts out obviously you will take them forward so money playing an important role in society you have to start today with your family and do not let it be a role and you have to put that that those values up there to be not let anyone divide you be it on the basis of religion or politics or whatever, whatever way they do it, on caste, on anything. 
if you do not let people divide you because they have a vested interest we have to start understanding vested interests with these vested interests for some reason are able to convince people and we have to understand how they can convince people if i can make a little kid wear a jacket and blow himself up i must be having very great motivational skills and the person who has who bring wants to bring peace doesn't have those motivational skills mehmat is talking so nicely about it is not will not have the same effect of someone who sits stands in front of those the thousands of people and gives them that large lecture of how this is the best for you and the world go do it to make someone give up their life you need to be a motivational speaker so do the people who want to talk about peace have to be trained on motivational speaking i think we have to start <laughs> looking at that aspect for sure there's some fundamental difference between the two there so that part yeah, of but, it... but the reality is that i mean uh, motivational speaker but the reality is not so brilliant i mean this is the most uh, sad part of it no no what i'm saying is hate speech hate speech you've heard of where have you heard yeah. of peace speech i want a peace speech that someone gave gave a peace speech it's not like that the same effect hate speech is recorded is media look at media i mean you have to look at how media plays a role is where are the vested interests there so there's so many such factors but because we are concentrating on mediation and how mediation is part of our culture we have spoken people from all over the world have spoken about that so are we saying that the traditional method of dispute resolution getting lost because of colonization because one that well, that one thing is coming up this so, is the most important point yeah so the culture of mediation to come, bring bring that back collaborative dispute resolution i am still repeating all the time i'll repeat that the fact that someone sitting as a maybe a policy maker or even in the un these are human beings they're people where did they come from what was their basic understanding of dispute resolution you talk about peace education i don't talk about peace education i specifically talk about mediation i talk about dispute resolution how do people actually help people actually dispute resolve the dispute not conflict management not all the nice non violent communication not all that keep doing that actually people should know that they can resolve the dispute themselves within themselves and i am telling you very small steps that one fight in the school of two people getting resolved between them not having a person of authority coming in not having a teacher coming in not being scared of oh if we resolve this dispute ourselves what is going to happen let's not do it so the teacher won't like it i'm telling you some things have such a very very basic source and sometimes we complicate it by thinking that on the larger international level it is different no these are the same people who came from this same background they have been looking at life from that perspective so i am saying that all these over how many 10 20 years they can play their politics let the vested interest do what they're doing because i don't have control over them you are still out there talking about it but i still feel at the grassroots level if i can start making that change there and then these people moving into society with that mindset that disputes can be resolved within ourselves hate speech and dividing people will continue for life the people will want to control it is the people who have to understand that look you don't fall into this trap that is what we have to explain to them how do you explain to them there are other factors so it's a very complex structure and complex things and definitely for us to be able to resolve it like that won't happen but the good part is you are out there you are talking about it and that what that what makes me happy that there are sane voices objective voices out there trying to bring people together to make them understand those basic things so i really like that appreciate that mehmat it's really nice uh, thank you there uh, mr vikram i hope to be we are future brother in arms in the yeah. future in different in places arms, that's the thing brothers in arms is always said brothers in peace is not said <laughs> <laughs> I mean yes I know what you mean I know what you mean I'm just saying that very nice in this yes once we start uh, using that that is where I will begin changes. using this thank absolutely, you absolutely absolutely but that's Because where change happens yeah we need to change ourselves as well yeah 
in every time. I'm telling Rather you, these, these words, peace. these each of those words have a meaning, and in the psyche of a person, everything has an effect. When you say brothers in arms, it means that it is not arms like that; it is arms like that. So, yeah. in those brothers in arms, we can get together only if we have some kind of uh, something that we can control people and gets. Let's get together in those movements. It is very easy to motivate people. but to motivate people to get let's get together let's talk to each other let's do good things that's the tough thing see and the simplest thing is the toughest thing <laughs> yes brothers in peace brothers in peace that's what it has to be so anyone else has anything to say please you can now we have time so you can definitely if you want to raise your hand you can just want to put it in the chat just do that because in sala session we were a little tight on time we are much better off sara you had something to say you are such whenever you nod your head i feel that yes something nice is going to come up yes sara no i i i have nothing to say for now thank you that's no sara you have to tell us from the african experience what mehmet said what all those things that resonate with you anything that you feel give me a few moments then i will to digest so much that he has told us <laughs> yes yes <laughs> because i'm telling you what his these voices are very important what mehmet goes out and talks about this whole ob- the objective way that he talks about it is at least easier to accept and hear otherwise it is normally about people talking about their positions and everything and we don't have those objective voices so D- D- david is there anything that you want to talk to mehmet about Mm. <clears throat> um yeah i enjoyed uh, listening to you uh, very much ah thank you very much uh, i think uh, an important point you made was the uh, um the problem of the nation state uh being something that's artificial uh a nation state when when you're dealing with the conflicts between nation states first we have to address the conflicts within the nation states and uh i think one of the reasons we cannot um, advance in uh, peace efforts i would i would know uh, from my point of view as an israeli uh between us and the palestinians for example is that there is no consensus within the israelis what the peace would uh, look like and there's no consensus within the palestinians what the peace should look like and uh i think when we, when you talk about a nation state like the former uh, Yugoslavia like the Soviet Union uh, like uh, many countries uh, in the Middle East like Iraq which is actually three uh, ethnic groups religious groups um i think uh, <clears throat> this is a matter that uh, mediators have to uh, have to highlight and uh, bring to the attention that um we have to address uh, differences within, within our nations before we are able and ripe to address uh, international uh, conflicts this is why i think this is where the role of mediators aspect of it i've been talking about because mediators first have to rise above all these internal politics and everything let me tell you give you an example of this symposium i had three people from tunisia who had confirmed suddenly they see on the poster there is someone from israel they said we can't we can't participate i had i mean of course this is what happening on whatsapp i was explaining to them as mediators also if you are not being able to rise above it then what hope do we have so but what i found out was finally after all this that their tunisian bar put sanctions on them if they talk to israelis or they are part of something where israelis are so it is a fear that is put in them so how do they be objective so now we are <coughs> we where where are those sane voices going to be coming out so we're not letting them come out also so i think that is why i have still have hope on mediation and mediators but it is a process which we are trying to put together i'm trying to do whatever i can to put people those people who have that objective point of view to get them together and let us see i mean we can make a difference but the first thing is these conversations have to happen so i because look personally i don't get into any of those individual political discussions but it doesn't make any sense finally if you break it down it comes to such simple simple very simple things that we can do to change things so i think we need to just i according to me just look at those simpler things first work on those 
and i see that if the right people are talking about it and when i said my thousand talk to a thousand get those thousand involved a million of them out there i think we can start making a difference what do you think mehmat is that yeah i am totally agree and i am so sorry uh, mr david i mean still the, this kind of approach i mean for not recognizing israel i mean, on the legal point in fact every state recognizes uh, israel because it's their obligation from the united nations charter and then we can say that this is a racist moment i mean uh, because uh, the difference is that the state policy is different being a citizenship is different i mean the state doesn't make the difference when they are acting against israel mr david i mean for example pakistan doesn't recognize uh, israel but on the other hand all the states who do not recognize israel had the obligation from the article 4 of the un charter that they in fact recognize israel they cannot refuse it and in their political approach they can uh, subject to article 2.7 of the un charter this is their internal affairs they can limit people <laughs> to officially get in touch with officials of israel i mean a academician from israel is different a person from minister of justice of israel is different if you are acting against mr david this is racism this is a crime i mean if the tunisian uh, bar is doing this this is under the definition of a racist approach yeah, absolutely that's what exactly what i'm saying that the fact is it starts at such basic levels and how do we get those sane voices outside if if you put fear in them that if they go out and speak to this person to that person this will happen so i i'm saying that if first let's put those voices together who can rise above all that and how many yeah, of them sure. are able to do that i have someone from iran who comes in so when there is someone from israel he says don't put me on the screen <laughs> but he's there and he is he's a sane voice i mean he's a young person very young person but at least he's willing to talk to people but the conversation always suddenly starts with the politics but i tell them don't talk about the politics ask them some nice things so then obviously nice conversation starts okay where did you travel you had a holiday so that is a person from iran is asking that person about israel he doesn't know anything about it he's never spoken to an israeli before so i'm just saying that the kind of divide and rule policy which is continuing we have to put an end to it people to people conversation has to happen let's start with that the younger lot i'm saying that we have to be able to bring that to them first to able to change the world at the at the top most level always starts with that basic let's put the foundation together we'll be able to do it so your last words because i'm why i have to do that is because these videos online on youtube are not watched when they are long if it is an hour okay let's watch it if it is 2 hours no we'll do it later so and i want your words of sanity uh, of objectivity to go out i mean uh, many thanks uh, to my dear three brother in peace and yes. sister in peace <laughs> many thanks Thank you very much, Mehmet, to be part of thank this. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm, we are going to have lots of conversations.